we want to raise up the next generation of ministry leaders to transform rural communities around the world. Lord willing, in August of 2020 will be our opening year for Crossroads School of Ministry and Leadership. I believe this generation of young people are going to encounter grace in a profound way like no other generation. We are going to take action to change the world in which we live. We're going to raise up the next generation of leaders right here in this church. Welcome, church. I said, welcome, church. Oh, so good to see you. And I want to welcome all of our campuses. As Hannah said, we are one church in eight locations. We have seven physical locations. We have the online community as well. So I welcome our online community that's watching this weekend. And of course, all of our fabulous campuses. I want to welcome you. I hope you've been enjoying the series, Good Ground, where we've been taking a look at what God did or what God started three years ago when he asked us to make a commitment yeah. to raise up the next generation of leaders and how you boldly, courageously, yes. willfully, and joyfully took that challenge. And we, uh, we pledged about $2.8 million and over 2.1 million has already come in. And I was talking to a young man two weeks ago uh, that attends our 8.30 service, and I challenged him. I said, you know, we are only $700,000 away, and I think God wants you to, <laughs> he's going to use you, and uh, you're going to see it come in. And he said, if God sends it to me, I'll send it in. So you never really know, do you, what God can do. Obviously, we're having fun, but there's also faith. You know, if somebody grabs onto something even in fun, and it kind of makes a huge difference. Well, here's what we're going to do so that all of our campuses uh, um, can participate with us. I'm going to have uh, Pastor Manny, would you and Sarah join me up here at this time? Um, you know, ministry, a lot of ministry is about people coming in to our presence and blessing us and then us being able to bless them as God sends them on. And a, oh, a month or so ago, actually a couple of months, you and I had been talking, God was stirring in your heart and doing some things. And so to make a long story short, um, you've, been, you've answered the call of God on your life to go to the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, God has done some tremendous blessings because all of your children are going to be able to go to a Christian school for free. Um, so that's exciting. But let me just say this, okay? We have so appreciated the influence that you've brought to our youth ministry. So I'm, I'm trying to be really positive and encouraging, um, but you, know, you didn't really ask me if you could go. You told me you were going. So if you would have asked me, I would have said no, but I... I, no, I've been around too long to know that you don't stand in the way of the will of God. And you, knew, you know it's the will of God. And once you told me that, I was like, okay, I have peace with that, and I will bless it. I won't like it, but I will bless it. How many know there's a difference? And so um, you have brought so much to our campus um, in just so many different ways. Your commitment to the Word of God, to see our young people in the Word of God, to excellence. I could go on and on and on. And so we just want to say we love you and we appreciate you. And we know that God has a great plan for your life. So why don't you just share a little bit about what your experience, what this experience has meant to you and what you're looking forward to in this next season of your life. Yeah, well, first I want to say thank you for, for your leadership through this. And as Pastor Rich said, we've been talking for a couple of months and you know, about three years ago, um, God called us uh, to come here. Uh, I lived in a big city, and I had no idea where Freeport was on the map until I put it in to our GPS. But um, about three years ago, God was doing a work in our hearts. And um, as we were growing in, in ministry and leadership, I felt like God put a verse on my heart. And it's one that I've been trying to live by 
since then, which is Psalms 37, 5. It says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and it shall come to pass. And over the last three years as we've come here and as we've really planted ourselves in good ground, we've just felt like we've been able to live that out, trust. Uh, and the thing about trust is, uh, if you look at a, a verse previous to that, it says that God will give you the desires of your heart. Mm. But the thing about that is that a lot of times the desires, the desires of our heart are truly the ones that God puts in us. And so um, as we've lived a life of trust and as we've tried to walk through that uh, faithfully, we find ourselves here at a crossroads, no pun intended. <laughs> but, um, but really, I just want to say thank you. Um, if I can be honest and real with the church today, when we came here, there was a big part of our hearts missing, I feel like, and, and we found family here. We found trust. We found accountability. We found a place where we can have hard conversations and talk through some difficult things and, and really challenge the status quo. And I've, I've found that in all of that, that's been welcomed. Um, it's not always been fun, but it's been welcomed. And it's through that, that, that growth uh, and faith have grown in us and gotten us to this point where we could say, God, whatever you want, mm. wherever you want, whenever you want, and truly mean that. And mm. uh, that's kind of what we found here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Manny. And Sarah, did you want to say anything? He said it all. <laughs> okay. A woman of very few short words. And, um, <laughs> and there's, a, there's a lot more to the story. That they're all good stuff. Yeah. And those of you that have been part of Crave, you get it and you know it. Yeah. But the main thing that I want to do on this weekend, because they're headed out real quick, I think December 1st, they're going to be, boom, taken off. And so we want to bless them. Yeah. And we want to be a church that blesses, um, not a church that curses. <laughs> but a church that always blesses, and we want to bless them on their way as they're going to their next. So could you reach out all across our campuses watching online? We're going to bless this couple and their family to great things. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for Manny and Sarah, for their kids. We thank you, Father, for the joy that they brought to our campuses, the joy they brought to our youth ministry, the joy that they brought to everybody that they've touched. And God, we, we are not happy. There's a, there, uh, let me put it this way. Lord, there's a void in our heart because um, we're losing somebody, somebody very special, a very special couple. But God, in your perfect will, we send them with our blessings. We thank you that you could give us, uh, let us be a part of their development. Let us be a part of their growth. And I know that they are on their way to great things. We bless and protect their children. We pray they'd find uh, good housing. Uh, we already know they've got great school. And we just pray every detail of their, of their transition would, would come together and work out wonderfully, God. Now we bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. and amen. 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 <laughs> We love you guys. We love you guys. Amen. Well, yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'll try to be happy. <laughs> we are going to pray that God will bring the right uh, replacement. As a matter of fact, I think uh, Kelly and I were saying, Manny, that's your job too. So you're going <laughs> to find that right replacement. All right, let's talk about celebration, all right? Tonight, um, this weekend, we're going to be talking celebration, how to celebrate good ground, how to celebrate good ground. Now, I want to share something with you. Um, I teach the principle of celebration a, a lot. I've taught it as a as an athletic coach, I've taught it as a life coach, uh, I teach it as a pastor. It's important to celebrate. And oftentimes in life, we don't celebrate enough. Have you noticed that? We don't celebrate enough. And we need to celebrate more. You know why? Because there's always going to be stuff that's going to bring you down. There's always going to be <laughs> there's always going to be stuff in your life that's going to be tough and difficult. So when we get a chance to celebrate, we need to celebrate, no matter what it is. If we can celebrate it, let's celebrate it. Now, here's what I think, because I'm going to, I believe it's in Exodus 23, 
And you don't have to go there. And I'm not going to teach on this specifically. But in Exodus chapter 23, God commands his people, the Jewish people, he commands them to celebrate. Now, how many know you probably have a hard time celebrating if somebody has to command you to celebrate? <laughs> and God says, I command it. Look at it, Exodus 20. And he, he institutes three major celebrations. Now, over a course of time, more is added to that, and there ends up being seven, but there's three major ones. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering. And you know what I say about that? That is a typical church right there. Feast, feast, feast. You feed them and they'll come, amen? Do we love potlucks or what? All right, so I believe God had it right from the beginning, man. Celebrate and eat. Celebrate and eat, all right? So here's this, this, this thing going on in the Old Testament. And when we get to the New Testament, God doesn't necessarily command things of us, but he, he says things like, in all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will for you in Christ Jesus. He talks about praising God in all circumstances, thanking God in all circumstances, rejoicing, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. So in the New Testament, he moves into this free will opportunity for us to celebrate. Now, what I'd like to share with you is that three years ago, when we decided that we were going to make a commitment and we were going to raise up the next generation of leaders. And we did that. We are now three years later into that. And it feels like God wants us to celebrate. That's what he wants us to do. All right? So I want to take us on a celebration journey for the next few moments. But here's what I discovered when I looked at these three festivals, when I looked at the other festivals in the Old Testament, when I looked at every time... God's people celebrated, I noticed something. They were usually celebrating three things. Now, I think if we could get our head around that and we can look at these this weekend, I believe we're going to be people better at celebrating. How many, how many of you would consider yourself a good celebrator? Okay. All right, about five. Okay. No wonder it's so quiet in this place. All right. All right. All right, so we're going to get you celebrating. We're going to, you know what a great goal would be for all of our worship teams if, if we could, at the end of the service this weekend, we actually even got some dancing going on, man. All right. All right. Celebrate, huh? Celebrate. All right, you're ready to celebrate? Yeah, okay, here we go. So here's the three things that they celebrated. First of all is God's provision. So let's go to Genesis chapter 22 really quick. Genesis chapter 22, and I want to talk about God's provision. How many know God is a provider? God is a provider, all right? And throughout the celebrations, people would celebrate. So the feast of ingathering, you'd celebrate um, by bringing your first fruits in because God provided so much abundance. He was such a great God. So let's go to, let's go to 22, 1 through 14. I'll just come over here and read it. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, where he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, and he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. Notice something here. And then we will come back to you. All right. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. And Isaac spoke up. I guess he would, wouldn't he? Because he knows what's going on. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. 
The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Okay, and Abraham answered, God himself, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. How many know God is a provider? Now, I want you to understand something because provision always begins with the seed, always. Needs are met through seeds. Needs are always met through seeds. And provision, no matter what it is, provision always begins with the seed. Philippians 4.19 says this, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus was the seed. On Mount Moriah, what God was doing is he was saying, I'm testing you, Abraham, but I am not going to use your seed. See, Isaac was Abraham's seed. God said, I'm going to offer my seed. It was a representation of what Christ would do for us later in the New Testament. And so he had a ram in the thicket provided, but it was a picture of in, when, it, when it comes to the New Testament, the, the only true provision for the forgiveness of sins and the removal of sins and for you be, to be united me will come through this, my seed, Jesus, my only son. He will be the one. And so Paul writes in Philippians, he said, my God shall supply all of your needs. Think of this in a minute. Think of this for a second. All of your needs are met through Jesus. Whatever you have need of today is met through Jesus. Jesus is your healer. Jesus is your provider. Jesus is the one who protects you. Jesus can mend what is broken. So my God shall supply all of your needs. How? Through Jesus. Why? Because first and foremost, provision always begins with the seed. And Jesus is the seed. God provides the seed to meet the need. That's what's so cool. So not only is a need met through a seed, but God provides the seed to meet the need. So whatever you have need of, plant a seed and God will meet the need. Not only that, God will give you the seed that you need to meet your need. I mean, come on, church. What kind of God do we serve? He says, look, I'm going to meet your needs, but it's going to take a seed. But the seed that you need, I'm going to give you. So I'll meet the seed that you need to meet the need that you see. And you can seed that and even have more. I mean, this is, this is good, good stuff. Abraham was obedient in offering his seed, Isaac, as a sacrifice. But God stopped him, said, nope, I'm going to provide the offering. Now, seed, the third principle under provision, seed must die to multiply. Amen. Seed must die to multiply. Let's look at John 12, 24. Seed has to die or it cannot multiply. John 12, 24. And my God will meet all your needs according, that's the wrong 
Um, uh, that's the wrong verse. I don't know how that, let's go to John 12, 24. No problem. I've got my, my real Bible right here, on, Manny, a real Bible, brother. Amen. So when technology fails you, baby, all right, you got God's living word with all your notes in it and your sweat. What did I say? John 12. All right. We're going to go to John 12 and uh, 24. Jesus, uh, I go 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is talking about himself here. And he's saying that that kernel has to go into the ground. In other words, that seed has to be planted and it dies. And when it dies, it comes back up and it multiplies. This is, this is amazing, amazing stuff. So let's go over this again. Provision always begins with the seed. God provides the seed to meet the need. The seed must die to multiply. And Jesus is that seed who died. And when he died, it came forth in us. So just like, just like Abraham offered Isaac, I believe the reason he offered Isaac, God was testing him to see because God wanted to make a great nation out of Abraham. And for that to happen, it had to flow through the generations. They had to come through Isaac. So the kingdom of God is going to is going to further advance because now you and I are the sons and the seeds of Jesus. Jesus died so that we could have life, so that we could be in him. And so it's multiplying all over the world. And, and so what are we supposed to do with this church? We're supposed to celebrate this. We're supposed to celebrate the provision of God. My God will provide all of our needs. My God will provide. My God, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of trial, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of hurting, in the midst of sorrow, my God will supply. He will provide. Amen? Now, let me share something with you. Um, I'm going to go to Psalms Let's go with me to Psalms 126. I, I really feel like I need to share this because I can just tell, and, and, and I'm not at the campuses right now, but when, whenever I speak and we record on Saturday evenings and then disseminate it to all of our campuses on Sunday, whenever I speak, I'm like going, Holy Spirit, go right through the camera. <laughs> all right, so I'm feeling right now, even though it's, this is tonight and tomorrow's tomorrow. I'm feeling right now, I'm feeling something in my spirit. That may seem weird to you, but God, I, God's given that to me. I feel something in my spirit. And here's what I feel. I feel that there is something happening all over the world and particularly in believers' lives. And there's this heaviness. There's a, there's a sense of, God, where are you? There's, there's a longing. There's spiritual battles. There's people that are struggling. They lo we love Jesus. We're here in church. We're not going to turn our back on him. But we're struggling. We're battling. We're battling with issues. And it's almost like um, I, heard, I was listening to my good friend who pastors in New York. And he was, I was listening to him on his podcast last night, and he was saying, I just get through one battle, and there's another one, and another one, and he's saying, Lord, just give me 10 minutes, and I'll celebrate. If you just give me 10 minutes in between these battles, I'll celebrate, man. I'll lift you up, Lord. I'll praise your name, and I felt like that, and God gave me Psalms. He said, go to Psalms 126, and 126 verse 4 says this, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev, or where the devotional comes from, streams in the desert. Many of you have read the devotional, streams in the desert. It's where this comes from. If you go on and read, it says, those, oh, I love this, those who are sowing in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. What this saying is, you might be weeping right now, but you keep planting seed because you're going to reap some joy. Yeah. Your situation is getting ready to turn around. 
God is getting ready to turn your situation around. Oh, somebody didn't hear me say that. God is getting ready to turn your situation around. You have been praying and crying for something to turn around. You have been weeping tears over your children, over a husband, over a wife, over somebody that's ill in your home. And God is saying, I am getting ready to turn your tears into dancing, your tears into joy, your tears into great victory. That's what God wants to do. Church, do you know, do you know that streams in the desert, the word is Negev, and do you know what that, you know what that means? It means a flash flood of blessing. Whoo, when I read that, I got excited. In other words, God's going to take what you've been going through and all of a sudden, boom, anybody ever been in a flash flood? Ever seen it on the news? You know how quick it can come. It can be like, in other words, in, back in the desert, in the streams in the desert of what uh, this scripture is talking about, it can be dry one moment, dry as a bone, man. And all of a sudden, boom, flash flood of blessing, flash flood of blessing. Woo! I'll tell you what. I came to preach this weekend. I came to preach this weekend. I'm speaking truth to you. I don't care if you're not clapping. I don't care if you're not standing. God's blessings are coming to you, church, every single campus. God's blessings are coming to us. Crossroads Community Church, God's blessings are coming to us in a flash flood. Your tears are going to turn around. Amen. The front rows getting a little spit right here, man. You got awful close to me. Praise God. That's the anointing and the blessing coming on you. What else are we going to celebrate, church? We're going to celebrate God's power. Everybody say power. Now, let me show you this. The Feast of Harvest was also called the Feast of Pentecost or Shabbat, and it marked the beginning of the wheat harvest. Now, this is so important. Because seed not only provides for you, seed opens the heavens and pours out a blessing. So, and um, the Feast of Harvest was 50 days after the first celebration. First celebration was Passover. So fast forward to the New Testament. Let me just lay a foundation for this. The day of power, the day of Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. So church, here's, here's the point. Offerings matter. Yes. Offerings matter. The seed of our time, the seed of our talent, and the seed of our treasure have been, they've been given to us by God. All right? God gives us time. God gives us talent. God gives us treasure. They've been given to us by God. And when, when our seed is offered to the Lord, he multiplies it, and then seeds come forth, what comes forth, what follows that is the Holy Spirit to anoint us with power. And that's what happened. So the celebration took place. What was Passover? Passover was Jesus saying, I'm going to be offered. I am the seed. 50 days later, and Jesus came back and he said this, hey guys, it's really important that I go through with this and I leave you. Because if I don't go to heaven, I cannot send the Holy Spirit. That's going to empower you to live this life. So the seed brought forth the power. And so in, even in, back in the Old Testament, there's like, you got to celebrate. Why you got to celebrate? You got to celebrate because you're going to have more power than any other nation. You're going to see Israel do things that they shouldn't do. This is a little tiny nation, but I'm going I'm to empower you. People are going to run from you. They're gonna be, they, they don't want anything to do with you because the, the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac is going to, going to be on you, the power. Now, in the New Testament, we receive the power. Yes. Jesus said in Acts 1, 4, and 5, do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised that you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now in the New Testament, Jesus is saying, okay, you're going to have a power too. And what does the power of the Holy Spirit enable us to do? Three things, church. Three things. Number one, 
it brings abundance. And abundance is simply this. Here's what abundance is. Abundance is the power to multiply. It's the power to multiply. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you have it more abundantly. Then Jesus said, I need to go to my Father so I can send the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can come and help you live abundantly. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Abundant means the power to multiply. Remember Peter? Here's Peter. Peter, Peter Peter's this guy following Jesus. When, el- when everybody else follows, uh, falls away from you, Jesus, I won't. No. But it, it was like 24 hours later, and he's denying Jesus three times. Okay? Fast forward. They go up into the upper room. Holy Spirit comes down. Tongues of fire. Peter, the denier, goes out and preaches. 3,000 added to the church right then. 3,000. Right? Amen. 3,000 added to the Monroe, to, to, the Morris, to the Morrison campus. Pastor John goes out and speaks under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Pastor John, 3,000 added. Okay? You're going to have to build a big, bigger building, bro. You don't have to build a building, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. 3,000 came abundantly. Second thing that happens with this power is anointing. Yes. Anointing. And anointing is the power to fulfill our calling. You can't fulfill your calling without the anointing, right? You, you, you can't. You can do good things. We can depend on talent, and talent will get you so far. Talent can fill a church, but it can't fill the spirit. Talent can get a crowd, but it can't touch cancer. It can't heal the sick. It can't lift up the infirmed. Very seldom can restore a marriage or put hope back in your heart, or set you free from an addiction. That takes the power of God. That takes an anointing from God. When you flow in your anointing, you flow in something that is beyond you. And we can celebrate it because when we planted that seed and the power of the Spirit came down, he anointed us and we can fulfill our calling regardless of our handicaps, regardless of what we can do or can't do. It doesn't matter if we flow in the anointing. That's so, that's why we got to celebrate his power in worship and in singing and lift him up and exalt him because we're exalting the power of the Holy Spirit operating in us. Does that make sense, church? Number three, here's the third thing we receive. Uh, we get, we receive authority. I love this. Authority is the power to stand against principalities and powers. To stand against them. Jesus said, all authority I'm giving you. He said, all authority I have been given on heaven and earth, but then I'm going to give it to you. So authority is the ability to stand against what we talked about about 10 minutes ago. Spiritual warfare. Attacks. Things that are coming to us, you gotta, you got to stand. When you've done all you can, you stand in the armor of God. You stand clothed in his righteousness. It's authority. Authority of the believer is very important. You have to know that you have been given authority to certain things. If you don't know you have, a, if you don't know you, you don't have authority, if you don't know you have authority, you will give in to everything. You will give in to, the, to the, the, the things of this world. But you have an authority to take a stand against sickness and death and hell and the grave. And the way the enemy wants everything to go down. Don't give in to the way the enemy wants it to go down. Take your stand. I'm not moving. I'm standing on the word of God. Authority. Take authority over it. In the name of Jesus. You, know, you don't have to be crazy or anything like me, but... Like I am being right now, but you can just calmly, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you. You have no place in my house, no place in my mind, no place in my business, no place in my husband, no place in my wife. Yeah, I'm sorry. I take authority. Just very calmly, 
take authority. You cannot have my kids. You can't have my, you can't, you, you, you just, no, 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 no. Blood was paid to give me the legal right to take authority over every demonic activity, every demonic thought, everything in this realm. Amen? All right. Let me, uh, let me go to the third thing that we, we can celebrate, okay? At these, the third thing is God's peace. His peace. Now notice the flow. God provides. He gives us his power. And he gives us peace. Peace. Anybody need a little peace? I think last week I sang a song. I won't punish you with that again. Okay. Peace. It was a song about peace. But in John chapter 14, where Jesus is teaching on the Holy Spirit, we just got done talking about that. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit in John 14, saying, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. In the same chapter, watch this. In the same chapter, Jesus promises his disciples the Holy Spirit. He also gives them another promise. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let me note a couple things real quickly. Number one, his peace is all-encompassing. It's all-encompassing. So in John 14, 27, Jesus is speaking, and when he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, he said it's basically the word uh, I give to you is bequeathed, it is inherit. So every believer has inherit. You don't have to work up your own peace, you already have his peace. Now that word uh, in, in Greek is Irene, but Jesus spoke in, he spoke in Aramaic. So he would have used the word, uh, the Hebrew word, shalom. Yes. And shalom doesn't just, hey, peace out. Right. It's not that. Shalom. Peace, shalom, according to Strong's Concordance, means welfare, health, prosperity, Peace, it also means state of untroubled, undisturbed well-being. It means that Jesus offers us his health, his provision, his peace, his untroubled, undisturbed well-being. It is our inheritance. That's why we should celebrate. Because in the midst of craziness of life, we actually have access to his peace. Now, the second thing I want to say is that our hearts, our hearts are the gateway to peace, right? Seeds cannot germinate and bear fruit when they are crowded and choked by thorns, cares, and worries and anxieties. Remember last week's message? Yes. It will be choked out with the thorns, okay? So our hearts are the gateway and our hearts are the valves by which peace flows out. If our hearts are troubled, peace cannot flow. It just doesn't. So it's important when Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled, he wasn't just, he, he, was, he was really wanting us to understand that. Okay? So I was, I've been going through several different battles um, in my life. Um, None of them have been fun, okay? But I will tell you this. I felt like the Lord spoke to me very clearly the other day because I was like, Lord, I, I just don't have peace. And this lack of peace is leading me to some anxiety and I can't, I can't get a grip on it. Like, even if I, I talk through it with my wife or I talk through it with one of my uh, friends why am I still like on edge with this? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, your heart is not at peace because you are listening and dwelling on what's in your mind. Your mind 
is causing you to think certain thoughts, but your heart needs to be at peace. In other words, what the Lord was saying to me, the truth about this situation is the truth. It's the truth. It exists. The challenge in front of you exists. But I say, don't let that trouble your heart. And I'm like, but God, that troubles my heart because of what my mind's telling me. And he said, yeah, that's why I told you to not let your heart be troubled. Because your mind's going to trouble you. Because you, you can talk about it. You can Google it. Right. Come on. Man, that'll mess you up quick. <laughs> and you start going, no, 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 no. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of it. Oh, I didn't think of that and that and that and that. And, and he said, no, let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. Let your heart, in this case, override your mind. Now, the last thing I want to tell you is this. I love this. Peace keeps what grace gives. And grace gives what peace speaks. Remember, remember the woman with the issue of blood? She's been, she's, she spent all of her money trying to get healthy. She has, she has an infirmity. She hears Jesus is coming to town. She runs out after him. She takes the risk. She touches the hem of his garment. She's immediately healed, right? I want to show you something maybe you've never seen before. It hit me in a very powerful way. In Mark 5, 34, it says this, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well, right? But watch this. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Daughter, you're healed, but go in peace and you'll be healed. Interesting. See, Go in peace is actually translated, go into peace. So whatever you're, whatever you're dealing with, Jesus is saying, okay, I've dealt with that. I dealt with that 2,000 years ago. Amen. All right, you ever getting confused about that? If he dealt with it 2,000 years ago, why am I dealing with it right now? Okay, but he dealt with it 2,000 years ago, and now he said, so go in peace. Why? Because... Peace keeps what grace gave you. You were saved by grace, but peace will keep you there. You were healed by grace, but peace will keep you there. Whatever you have received by grace, peace is what keeps it. That's what makes it work. Now, because peace retains and keeps everything that grace has given to us. Come on. Peace keeps it. What do you have? What, what's God given you? What's he given you? What's he given you through grace? Peace will keep it. If you're worried about losing something, you're not in peace. Okay? Now, let me show you one last thing. Can I show you one last thing? One last thing. Okay? I want to show you this. And grace gives what peace speaks. Grace gives what peace speaks. Let me show you this. I love this story. In 2 Kings chapter 4, this is a great story. Story of Elisha and the Shumanite woman. So this woman is barren, but she sets up this place for the prophet Elisha to come and hang out at her house and it's a long story. She's very well-to-do, and he wants to do something for her, and she can't figure out what to do. So he just said, he, he says this, he goes, you're going to have a child. <laughs> it's like, I didn't ask for a child. No, <laughs> I'm going to have a child, okay? I already have had two. I don't want any more learning. Okay, I already had... <laughs> Just kidding. You're going to have a child. So a year later, she has a child. Life goes on. One day... He's out working with his father, has these tremendous headaches. The father says, take, in, 
take the boy into the mother, takes the boy into the mother, the mother holds the boy, and the boy dies. Crazy story. So the lady goes in and puts her dead son on the bed of the prophet Elisha. Shuts the door, starts to head out, and it's kind of like this. I'm paraphrasing this, but this is the general idea. <laughs> the husband says, hey, where are you going? She says, well, I'm, I'm going to go look for Elisha. She didn't say, she didn't even say, our son is dead. And so he's kind of trying to feel things out. And so what's going on? And, you know, is everything. And here's what she said. She said, it is well. Like, is anybody out there doing what I'm doing? Like, uh, your son died. No, it is well. It is well, right? So she goes to look for Elisha. And Elisha sees her coming from afar and says this three times to her. Comes and says, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your son? Is it well? And here's what she said, it is well. Now, a long story short, okay, Elisha ends up going back, going in, laying on the child, and one of the resurrections from the dead that's mentioned in the Bible. The sun comes to life. What's, what's your point, Pastor Rich? Do you know it is well <laughs> in the context of this scripture, there's one word for it, and it's a Hebrew word. Does anybody want to guess what that word, it is well, means? What the word is? It is shalom. It's the Hebrew word shalom. Here's my point. Are you in a challenging situation? Are you going through a trial? Are you going through a struggle? Are you going through something? This woman refused to speak anything but peace and grace. Shalom. She just wouldn't say, she, she just wouldn't say, she wouldn't even tell her husband. I don't know about you, but most of us would come running out of that room. Honey! Wow. She comes out. It is well. The boy and I will return. Why? Because God has provided. It is well. Even to the prophet. I would have run to that prophet. Elisha, come on. Come back to my house. My boy is sick. He's died. It is well. It is well. She had, he had to find out. She withheld it. It is well. Shalom. 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 Peace. Health. Prosperity. See, see, peace keeps what grace gives. And peace, grace gives what peace speaks. When you speak over something, the very words of life, when you speak shalom over your situation, there's peace. So church, what are we celebrating? We are celebrating the provision of God through the seed. We are celebrating the power of the Holy Spirit that's been manifest to us because of that seed. And we, because of manifest power, we are celebrating Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In fathomless billows of love, oh peace. Come on, church. Peace, if you know it, sing it. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In fathomless billows of love. I don't think I'll be signing a recording. Uh, <laughs> contract soon, but let it minister to your heart.
and especially those of you that are in a battle. Matter of fact, could I pray? Could I pray for anyone who may be not at peace today? Something's stealing your peace. Something's robbing your peace. Something real. Maybe something going on in your body. Maybe something, a negative report from a doctor. Maybe maybe a report at work. Maybe you've been doing this in one of your relationships. You're just not at peace. You're not at peace. I understand that. I'm with you. I'm with you. I've been fighting for my peace. I've been wrestling for my peace. I want to be able to say it is well. and I'm going to commit to it. I'm going to try to do it here because it's not here. But I know one thing. I know God's peace is available to us because his word says it. I know we have it because his word says we've inherited it. And I know that if we can land in that place of shalom, it is well. How is it going to be well, Rich? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how your situation is going to work. I don't know how my situation is going to work out. But I know it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well. In the midst of it all, God will find a way. He will find a way where there seems to be no way. And I want to pray for you. I sincerely mean that. I wanted to do this from the beginning. I want to pray for you wherever you're at, whatever you're going through. Please allow your pastor to pray for you. Would you bow your hearts with me? Whatever it is, just kind of offer it to him. What is the situation that you're going through right now? Lord, I just pray. There's so many battles that we're facing. Battles that are, they're beyond us. They're bigger than us. Honestly, Lord, battles that are scary. Battles that could look like that it could be tough, a tough going from here on out. But God, you're a God that can raise things that have died. You did it in the Old Testament. You did it in the New Testament. You can raise up dreams, visions, callings, relationships. You can strengthen and quicken our bodies. And Father, I believe in miracles and I pray for miracles. But the miracle that I'm praying for on this weekend is that we would be able to celebrate your peace that overrides everything. Lord, when you were in the storm that the disciples thought was going to take them all out, you stood up and you rebuked it and said, peace, be still. And I say to every heart that is battling for peace, peace, be still. It is well. It is well. I say shalom to you and peace be in your heart. Let peace rule and let not your heart be troubled. And collectively, as a body, we receive the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I put the blessing on you of peace, of provision, and of the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. Amen. Do you receive that, church? You receive that? Just give the Lord a praise if you receive that prayer. That's for you. That prayer's for you. Amen. Thanks for watching Crossroads Community Church online. We'd love to hear that you are here today. You can fill out our online connection card with your prayers, 
praises and any questions you have at crossroadscn.com connection. Links are also provided in our bio. If you want to stay up to date, check out our website for upcoming events that are happening at your campus. Thanks again for watching. God bless.